of our operations agenda meeting for tonight. All right, and it looks like our number has stabilized. So once again, I'm Lynn Jeannie Hatton. Welcome to our guest tonight as we get ready to kick off our April 7th operations agenda meeting. Thanks for being here with us. All right. Ready to go? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Lynn. Welcome everybody, I'm George Katanis and um, welcome to the April 7th operations committee meeting. And before we get started here, I'll read this. Pursuant to board policy 1B5, all meetings of the Salisbury Township School District are audio and video recorded. The district disclaims any and all liability arising from the recording of meetings and uh, main governing um, and for any statements made by these in attendance. Um, okay, so... Um, that takes us uh, to a call to order, which I am doing. And uh, can I have a roll call, please, Mr. Taylor? Yep, uh, Mr. DeFrank. Here. Ms. Frick. Mr. Gatanis. Here. Ms. Glenister. Here. Mr. Ganahl. Here. Mr. Hattinger. Here. Ms. Klinger. Here. Ms. Nemitz. Here. Ms. Ziegler. Here. And we have a quorum. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, that takes us to item 2.1, PSBA update. Karen Devine, welcome, first of all. It's nice having you here, and the computer is yours. Thank you. It's great to see you tonight. I try to get out to all of the districts in my territory at least once a year. So thank you for your willingness to allow me to join your meeting virtually and for finding time for me to give a quick update on tonight's agenda. And thank you for your membership to PSBA and for all you do as school directors. So I'm going to summarize a few services that we have available to our members and then uh, some upcoming events. I want to make sure everyone's aware of energy solutions. They will help school districts save in energy costs and you can contact us. There's information on our website if you are interested in a free energy assessment. We also provide equity services for, board, for districts and we have many resources on our website. We offer complimentary board self-assessments and a lot of boards are doing those right now. We're, we're in that time of year where boards are thinking about retreats. And if you are interested in a, a free board self-assessment, we can help you with that. In addition to our policy services, we also provide human resource services. And that includes job description services, staffing studies, compensation studies. We also have superintendent evaluations that are complementary for our basic evaluation. And success starts here. If you look at our website and scroll all the way to the bottom, you will find success starts here. Click on that, look up your school district, and you will see demographics for your school district. All the information will be there in addition to any success stories that you have submitted to PSBA. Continue to share, share your stories so we can put them on that part of the website and we can share those through social media as well. So we can see the exciting things happening in your district. Also, we recently launched the Keystone Center for Charter Change. It's led by Larry Feinberg. He's board president in Haverford Township. He's the director of that. And you should be receiving PA Charter Change Roundup newsletter every day. And if you are not receiving that, just email me and I'll give you my email at the end. And I'll make sure you're receiving that in addition to the daily edition each day for the latest on what's going on in public education. And then of, of course, with charters. Be sure to join us and other school directors from across the state for the monthly exchange. We have that every third Thursday of the month from 1230 to 130. It's for all school directors. 
And then we have the school board secretaries monthly exchange the second Thursday of each month at 1230. And each one just runs an hour. And then the weekly buzz for school board leaders is every Tuesday at 12.30 to 1.30. Everything I'm mentioning is complimentary. Uh, we have spring legal roundup for school directors. That's coming up April 28th. So you can see all the case law and all the changes in the law that might be impacting districts. And again, that's April 28th. The registration's on our website. It's from 1.30 to 4.45. We have the final board president's panel taking place Wednesday, April 14th. We're offering a day session at noon or an evening session at six. And they're each only an hour and 15 minutes long. And this one will be on communications. And NSBA's conference, the National School Boards Association is this week. So it is April 8th through the 10th. Look for the 2021 State of Education Report. All of you should start receiving that in your mail. And we hope that you will find that helpful as we focused on the impact of COVID-19 on our school districts. I just shared a lot of information. I hope I kept it within five minutes. But if you have any questions, just email me at karen.devine and it's D-E-V-I-N-E -E at PSBA.org. Thank you so much for your time tonight. And again, for all you do as school directors during these most challenging times. And I hope you have a great evening. Thank you, Karen. Uh, everything that you say is the case. I know everyone that I've attended is well worth it. Um, and I, I know other board members have too, but everyone I have attended, I'm glad I did. And, uh, and it also nice collaborating with other uh, board members of other districts. And uh, I find that really being helpful too. So uh, thanks again. And thank you so much for that feedback. And we hope you'll continue to join us. Okay, have a good night. Thank you. Any, you uh, excuse me, any other any questions for Karen from anybody? Okay, seeing none. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you much, Karen. Good, good night. night. Thank Have you. Good night. You too. Okay, that takes us to the budget update, um, Mr. Taylor. Right. Let me just share my screen. All right, can everybody see the presentation? Yes. All right. So a lot of this information will be similar to what we've seen before, just uh, putting it up there as reminders, but I'll highlight obviously the changes as we go through this. So the timeline is getting shorter as we're getting closer to the end of the year and the budget process. Next steps on the uh, budget would be uh, May 12th, uh, adoption of the proposed final budget. And then on May 27th would be when the proposed final budget's available for public review. And then the final step would be on June 16th, adoption of the final budget. Um, so as we're getting closer, you know, we'll, we'll see the changes there. Uh, proposed final budget budget revenues. Uh, most of this information is the same, but if you remember in the prior updates, we did not list any increases for federal revenues. And that's just because we didn't know if there was going to be any changes yet. Uh, but one thing we have added into the budget at this point now is the CARES Act funding in the amount of $472,088. And I'll explain it a little bit more in depth. That's uh, not all we're getting, but we can budget that now because that is the amount that we are allocating to be uh, spent in expenditures that we'll get reimbursed for for next year. So we've included that in the budget at this point. What is the CARES Act and the ESSER funding? Sometimes we might refer to it as CARES Act or ESSER funding. Uh, ESSER, there's been three phases of it now, and that's the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. So with all the different stimulus packages, basically every time uh, taxpayers have gotten checks, uh, the government's also approved additional funding for other things. And ESSER is the other, uh, one of the other pieces that affects the school districts. The first ESSER grant was small and that's already been done. But the second ESSER grant, which uh, was awarded back in January, allocated $1.7 million to the school district. Uh, now that's not just for this year and it's not automatic. Those are, uh, you know, we have to, allocate expenses to those 
uh, to that grant funding based on eligibility, and then we get reimbursed for those expenses. And the timeline is, is we can spend that money now through September 30th of 23 in the initial grant, but the tidings amendment to the General Education Provisions Act extended that deadline to actually September 30th of 2024. So since we might not all spend it and get that money next year, we're only budgeting uh, funds once we've actually allocated those expenditures towards those for next fiscal year. So that's why we've allocated the 470,000 uh, and not the whole 1.7 million. And then in March with this, uh, the American Rescue Plan that was just approved, uh, they approved ESSER 3 funding, which currently the state shows an allocation for the school district of 3.4 million. And the timeline's the same. Uh, so those are things that will help us over the next couple of fiscal years. Uh, once we start um, budgeting and allocating what we're spending those on, if we can app uh, apply it to the budget, we will. But at this point, we've only applied that first 470,000. The governor's budget, and not much has changed here except for that the legislator said basically it was dead on arrival because of all the things that were thrown into it. But we don't know what that means exactly for the state funding and for the, for the school district's funding because really the increase in funding was really tied more to the personal income tax increase. Don't know if that will still remain in the budget once they get through it or not. Uh, but the one thing I did wanna highlight and it's in red, uh, last time we didn't show what the proposed increase in the special ed funding for the district would be, but that's another uh, quarter of a million dollars. So um, we had shown the increase in the basic ed funding, but now we have the numbers that are proposed for the special ed, so I wanted to show that as well. And it's obviously, as soon as we get any more information on the governor's budget, we'll share that. Expenditures, we've gone through this before, the salaries, benefits, transportation costs, special ed, and charter school. We reviewed before how charter school affects our budget and that it's not really uh, equates, you know, for every student that leaves, we don't necessarily save that amount of money. The uh, non-special ed charter school student, 15,000, special ed, 35,000. The challenge is that our, we don't save that money when they leave. We, we don't reduce teachers or our utilities or any of that stuff. So it does put a burden on the district. And uh, the non-special ed student, it takes about four median residential property tax dollars to fund one non-special ed and about 10 median residential properties tax dollars to support one special ed student. The proposed final budget expenditures, uh, the salary adjustments where you know, we have in there built in there currently the uh, contractual uh, scheduled raises for the teachers, uh, you know, professional staff for the teachers, for the Act 93, uh, Act 93 employees and the support staff with their new contract, they get the Act 1 index. Uh, so we have all that budgeted in. We have the increase for the PEASERS retirement, which is going up from 34.51 to 34.94 percent of all salary dollars and the health insurance increase of 10% for next year. We've already reviewed the allowable millage before that we can increase it by the Act 1 index of 3%, which gives us allowable increase in real estate tax dollars based off the current mill, uh, assessed values of $770,955. This just goes into again what the required millage rate was based off the preliminary budget, which exceeded the Act 1 index. Uh, but we were not eligible to apply for exceptions, so we're limited to the Act 1 index increase of 3%. All right. uh, the update here with the proposed final budget summary, obviously there's been no changes in the Act 1 index and, the, and we still are not eligible for the exceptions. So the max tax increase would be that 3%. But we did add in here the changes now with the uh, funding that we have for the CARES and ESSER that we've allocated. So that brings our gap down from 1.2 million to about uh, 762,000. We're still waiting to hear a little bit more about the assessment appeals we've done, waiting to hear more about um, the governor's budget uh, to see how we close that gap. And then, like I said, we could still potentially allocate some additional funds from the grants, uh, depending on what expenditures we allocate towards that. Uh, but at, the, at this current moment, the, the gap would still be the 762,000 with a tax increase in the uh, grant funding that's allocated. Like I said, the big thing that's really out there still is the state budget uh, based on the, uh, the proposed budget from the governor uh, that would increase our funding. And actually, this is 1.4, that's really from the basic uh, 
basic ed and some of the other stuff. I mean, but we had the, the other quarter million still for the uh, special ed as well. Uh, and we're still waiting to hear on employee retirements. We should be hearing those in the next few weeks. They're supposed to last those 60 days prior to retirement. So by the May uh, proposed final, we would have any adjustments in there from the employee retirements. And if there's any updates on the state budget at that point. Is there any questions on the update to the budget from the board tonight? Mike, uh, I have a, Sam DeFrank here, just a question for you. Um, that money we use from the CARES Act, you said it, it, it's be used over up to 2024? Yes. September. But when we use that and we put it against expenses, that's not reoccurring revenue. We're just taking it for each one. So when that runs out, there'll be a hole or a divot in our budget that we'll have to fulfill. So the 472 is helping us now and I'm happy to have it. I'm not, but it's really something that we have to plan to either reduce cost or increase revenues that fulfill that when it goes away. You're absolutely right. And that is why we are not allocating more at this point in time. And really the best thing is, is to try to allocate it towards one-time costs. Yes. And, 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 and this first amount is allocating towards our lease payment for the uh, computers that we'll be getting. Mm -hmm. And we could potentially do all four years of this next lease uh, through the ESSER two grant. That has not been determined yet if we're doing that, but uh, that would, you know, help us, you know, stage that off. But uh, yeah, we don't want to spend it all in one year because like you say, we'll have to make it up. So we're trying to be strategic in how we roll it out while also making sure that we get all of our funding by spending it appropriately. Um, but uh, yes, that is something that we have to plan into our five-year forecast that anything that we use on operating expenses, we are prepared to uh, make up for that when it runs out. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Mike, I have a question for you too. Um, I had emailed you a couple weeks back and then forgot to ask you about at the next meeting um, to explain that news article about the PISERS adjustment. Can you talk about that and how it might affect us in the future? Absolutely. So they adjust PISERS over time right? And they had that PISER shortfall. And that's why uh, they've increased uh, the PISER's contribution rates for the employers and why it keeps going up. And uh, actually, I'm looking at the number back in 2010, 2011, two, uh, 10 years ago, the employer contribution rate was 5.64% of salary dollars. And this year, we're at 34.51%. So that's been part of the financial challenges districts have been facing over the last 10 years is how rapidly that grew. Um, so they changed it for employees that started last year. They have new rates for them. And it's not as lucrative of a plan for them going forward for new employees uh, to try to help reduce the cost of the pension plan. The problem is, is it's going to take many years of new employees before it really takes effect. That news article that you came, came across really is uh, for the current, the newest group of PISERS employees and the ones before that, they had basically a shared risk provision in employee contributions. So it would not affect the employer contributions. It would not affect the school district. But what that shared risk says is they got to meet certain targets and they check them annually. And if they don't meet those targets, it could increase the employee's contribution. So people who were in the TE or TF plan were the first groups that had the shared risk and the TE plan had employees contributing seven and a half percent of their income. And the T and the other group was contributing 10.3%. If the fund missed their projections, they could increase those, I think it's up to 2% more, but only in half percent increments. So they said that they met that target growth by just the thinnest of margins. So they were not going to increase employee contributions for next year. Now they're saying, well, maybe that was calculated wrong. And if they, and if they did miss a target and if they should be increasing contributions, that half a percent on all those employees, I think it was something about $25 million or whatever that number was that the fund would be missing out on by not changing that. So they were trying to get an independent review of it and see which number is accurate. But yeah, if they do not increase, and that's where they're saying the lost money would be for the plan is, you know, is, is whether they actually make that change or not to the contribution. And then theoretically they're saying, if the employees don't make it up, the funds can be short by that additional amount which means they'll probably keep increasing player contributions over time. It won't change the rate for next year, but potentially they might have to increase the employer contribution rate in the future a little bit more to compensate for the lack of growth. But okay. so the short of it is, is potentially employee contributions might go up next year, but not the employer. 
Okay. Great. Does, that, does that help? Yes, very much. All right. Mike, Mike, um, on that same issue, uh, can you explain to the public, I'm not sure everybody understands when you talk about, you know, like well, that, that 35%, that basically means our payroll budget, we have to take 34% of it and send it to the state for the retirement fund. In essence, that's pretty much it, right? Correct. So Peasers is the, uh, you know, the, the pension plan, the retirement fund for uh, school district employees. And let's just say if somebody earns a hundred thousand dollars salary, yes, we have to now send thirty four thousand dollars on top of that to the state. Uh, and, and, and like I said, ten years ago, it would have been five thousand dollars. And with salaries and benefits being two thirds of your expenditures, when you're adding on thirty percent more, um, that that has been a financial challenge for for all school districts in the state. But uh, it keeps going up. It's been it had been growing faster than the Act One index over those ten years. And that's why in most years we had the ability to do exceptions uh, for PEASERS and special ed because special ed uh, growth as well. But yes, you're sending basically a third of your total payroll to, in addition to that to the state for the, for the pension plan. So what it amounts to is, um, what is our second highest expense for the district? Is that PEASERS or is that, could that be yeah, transportation it's, 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 or PEASERS? No, nope, nope, it's, it's PEASERS. You know, your uh, salaries are ballpark 15, 16 million. So about five, 6 million of its PEASERS. Transportation's, you know, about 2.53 million. Yeah. So, uh, PEASERS okay. is the second. So the, second that's huge. Expense. And secondly, the, uh, the act one, the fact that we can't use exceptions. I'm happy for the taxpayers, don't get me wrong, but can you explain ballpark what that number is on how much more we have to tighten our belts in terms of us not being able to go with the exceptions for uh piecers and special ed ballpark yeah so last year we were eligible for uh, about six hundred thousand dollars of exceptions uh so if we if that trend had continued again this year we could have potentially you know closed the gap between the the funding that we just showed from the cares act and an increase but like you said, George, that's increasing the, the, the taxes on the taxpayers, but we don't have that avenue this year as a tool. So we have to find these other resources. Fortunately, there is some of this other funding this year, but like Sam pointed out, it's, it's a one-time spread over a couple of years that we will have to make up for if we use it to close budget gaps. So it, it's, it's a blessing this year, but it's gotta be done very responsibly so that we don't get caught in a pinch in future years, kind of like spending fund balance. When you spend right. fund balance, you gotta make it up in the future. Right. Mike, Mike, I don't mean to put you on the spot here, but um, so we're, we're still sowing a, a seven hundred fifty thousand dollar gap, give or take a few, a few dollars. Yep. Um, and, and so with, with all the, the the things that you listed before that are still outstanding, whether that's potential retirements, state budget uh, um, and other things, how confident are you that we're going to be able to get there just by um, what's still outstanding? Um, there's a number of different avenues to get there. Uh, obviously there's some that are might be more favorable than others for the, for the five-year forecasting, you know, like we said about the grant funding, if you, yeah. Use that, yeah, we can make it close this year, but then you got to worry about the next year. Uh, but I mean, there's a couple different ways. I mean, we have the, you know, the, we, the board's aware that the selling of the, uh, the old computers this summer, uh, we got a guaranteed minimum that was very healthy. Uh, we made out very well this year that, um, you know, that's unbudgeted at this point because we don't have an exact dollar number that we're getting yet. We'll get that closer to, but that in itself could potentially close the gap if we got nothing else. Um, the challenge that is this, that money was really earmarked though to go towards infrastructure and, and other stuff that, that we hadn't budgeted in the past. So we don't want to have to use it on that, but worst case scenario. So the board rests easy. We're not looking at major cuts like we had last year, right? We're not looking at losing staff because we're already pretty bare bones there as it is you know, in the teaching ranks and in some of the positions we cut last year, uh, it'd be hard for the district to absorb more cuts there. So we aren't looking at having to do that with the grant funding, with the, the money from the computers, with the, whatever we potentially get from the state. Um, we're confident that we'll be able to close this gap without having to really sacrifice the valuable assets that we have in the district this year compared to like what we had to do last year. We just have to might you have to use more one-time funding like the the sale of the computers or easers or things like that where 
and, and yes, it's good that we have that option to do that this year, but that's this year. We're not going to be able to sell the computers again next year. So, correct, correct, yeah. and and that's where potentially we might have exceptions available in future years. But also, yeah. we have some time, and we're we're looking at that. Anything that we use like this, whether it's the the funds from selling the computers or the grant funds that we're using to close this gap, we want to look and see. Okay, how are we making that up in the future and plan that out now? rather than wait until next year, how do we close that gap? So no, it is something that the administration is looking at. That's why we don't want to commit to closing the gap that way right now. Yeah. If we close it with additional funding from the state, that's going to be reoccurring. Or if we close it from, you know, employee retirement, <clears throat> um, that obviously would be reoccurring savings that we would be able to benefit from. So that's our first preference because it, it, it gives a better outcome on the five-year forecast for us. Um, but we also have these other avenues in the, in the, in the, in the back of our mind that we're prepared for if we have to use those. Right. So yeah. we're trying to do our due diligence to make it the best picture long-term, but we're comfortable that people can sleep at night that we're not cutting more teaching positions that we aren't able to cut. Now. And just, just to follow up on that. Um, and you, my computer was choppy a little bit earlier on. Uh, do we have an idea of when we might see numbers come out of the state and the governor's office as far as the, the budget? It, it's really hard because um, I know. I mean, some, sometimes it was like after we needed to approve it. I remember a couple of years ago. <laughs> yeah, and, and, yes. and, and part of the challenge with that is is because of everything that's put in there. There's a lot of wish list stuff in there, right? Yeah. Uh, the the minimum wage for workers yeah. going up to fifteen dollars an hour eventually. The minimum wage for teachers going up to forty five thousand dollars. The uh, cyber charter reforms. So there's a lot of wish list stuff in there. And the problem is, is there's competing interests on both sides that there's no way that they're going to say, okay, yeah, let's pass it as it is. There's going to be some probably adjustments and whether they're significant, striking out a lot of stuff or, or more minor, there's going to be a lot of haggling and hassling over it, right? And probably some political posturing, especially, I mean, the minimum wage is a big political partisan issue. Um, and then also you're talking about the, uh, the income tax increase. It hasn't happened for many years. Um, and you know, it, it, they might strike out some of those other things, but if they keep that uh, income wage increase, they could still probably fund a lot of the uh, the, the educational uh, increases. So, yeah, I, I think the earliest we'll start hearing it and idea of things would probably be later in May after our proposed final, but hopefully we find out something before our final. And what we could do is, since we have these possibilities of using some of these other not as advantageous funding options, we could proceed with those. And as the state funding does go through, it would fill in as either surpluses to go back to fund balance or then to be able to fund the, the potential infrastructure stuff that we weren't able to do by allocating the computer sales. So we're looking at all those different options and, and yeah, it'd be nicer to know it sooner, but we're prepared that if it does come out late and if we do get the benefit of funding that we weren't expecting from the state to make sure that we have allocated appropriately. All right, any other questions from Mike? Okay, Michael, unless you're, are, are you, you have, but what, you, are you done yet? I'm done with this. Yeah, but uh, what I'll do is uh, I will introduce the next topic item. All right. So before we introduce that, just a reminder to our attendees, if you'd like to make a comment during the citizens comment section, please add your name and address in the chat. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, so we added an agenda item to this meeting and I just wanted to give you a, a little brief update. So last week at the uh, curriculum meeting, there was a, uh, a concern raised uh, regarding buses on 78. And if we remember back a year ago when we were discussing the closing of Western, uh, that we anticipated at that time we would not be using 78 for elementary school routes. Uh, it was brought to our attention that there was at least one bus or potentially more buses that were uh, using 78 to transport students. So the administration uh, went and looked at it Tuesday morning last week and identified that the routes had been drawn up without utilizing 78. Uh, however, we had, did not give an edict to Paragon to never use it because we do the routes without it. And in the past, they've utilized 78 for middle school, high school routes, LCTI, uh, whether it was drawn on the routes or whether it was dictated by timing of things. Um, so they didn't. the drivers didn't realize that they weren't allowed to utilize it for timing, right? Um, so we contacted Paragon on Tuesday morning and asked that for those elementary routes, please do not utilize 78 unless it's absolutely necessary because of an accident or road closure or whatever. 
and there was no issues with that. Uh, but we just wanted to uh, bring Russ here tonight to answer any questions that the board may have regarding the use of 78 for LCTI, uh, you know, field trips, uh, athletics, or middle school or high school, and see if there's any concerns with that. And then Russ can share some information regarding the uh, experiences the districts had on 78 in the last 15 years since Paragon's been doing it. Uh, but it's really more of a checking to see what questions the board may have, or if they just want Russ to give a little update on what, what's been happening with the transportation. So George, did uh, did any board members have any questions that they want to ask Russ or do they just want Russ to give a little update? Well, before I ask the board, I just want to make a quick statement. Um, Russ, um, I guess, I guess before we get onto this subject, I want to thank you for everything you've done through the years. I was on the board that approved you, the contract, your first contract with us, and you stuck with us and only us in terms of your dedication to Salisbury. And I want to thank you for that. Uh, you bend over backwards for us, even so much as helping out in our concession stand during football games, you're in there helping us out. So I just want to bring, you know, I want to mention that before we get started with this uh, Route 78 uh, conversation. So um, thank you. Unless, uh, do you want to uh, make a statement prior to any potential questions for us? Well, th uh, thanks for that uh, intro. I, I lived in Salisbury for many years and, and Salisbury means a lot to me, obviously. Um, but I, uh, um, I know we've been using, uh, we've, this is our 15th year and we've been using uh, Route 78, 309 for many levels of children. And as does all the other districts, uh, use, especially for Botech, Southern Lehigh, Saucon Valley, East Penn, well, not East Penn, I guess a little bit of East Penn, Parkland and Allentown and Deerf. It's just the way to, to use it. I have some stats on differences in mileage and, and the times, but over the 15 years we've been with Paragon, you've been with Paragon, we put about 550,000 miles on Route 78 going to Botech. So we have a, our drivers are experienced, they're well trained, and uh, we, have, we, you know, we, we believe it's safe. We, we believe our drivers are trained as best as they possibly can be. And we're comfortable with running the, the highway uh, because I believe in my drivers. So I, I'll ask any, you know, answer any questions you like or uh, whatever, you, whatever you prefer. Uh, let me know what you want, what you'd like. Okay, um, I have some questions, but I'd like to offer it to the board first. Sarah, it looks like you have some. Yeah, I have a question. I think the main concern that was brought up a year ago was the fact that we were putting children who in their parents' cars have to be in a car seat on a bus on a highway. Um, and I'm wondering if you could, I mean, are there mm -hmm. other districts that use 78 for daily transportation of elementary school students or are we the only ones? I can't answer that question, uh, be honest with you. other than Votech. I know they all use it along the run there, but. But those are high school. Um, correct, they're high school students. The concern students. is with like the smaller children mm -hmm. on the bus on the highway. And I understand that they're probably on it for a very short stretch, but. They are. As a parent of a second grader myself, like it was, it was a concern of mine a year ago. Well, I think it's important to note that uh, if there was to be an incident, a child is, tenfold safer on a school bus than in a car, whether in a seat or not, just because of the size of the vehicle, how it's made, how the seats are designed to uh, compartmentalization that if there is some sort of an incident, there's cushion around them. I mean, I, I have a whole presentation to school board uh, on the safety of a school bus versus in a car. So I can sit here and tell you that a school bus, no matter what road they're on, Mayas Avenue has tractor trailers too. They are much safer on a school bus. Uh, there's statistics which escape me, but I haven't given that presentation in a while. Um, but they're in a they're in a much stronger, tougher vehicle. They're also going on a, a divided highway, so there's no crossover. Of course, there could theoretically be, but on Mass Avenue and Lehigh Street, etc., there's no dividers, so you have the safety of heading the same direction, if nothing else. It's a short period of time. It's a short period of miles, but. 
Um, some things we just can't avoid using, obviously, at Votech. We just, um, we did a, uh, it was uh, 40 minutes to use the back roads at Votech, and it was 25 minutes to use 309. So that would add 15 uh, minutes to each Votech run, which is timeliness and et cetera. So we've done some studies and looked at things, but the bottom line is my drivers believe that even though they're not their kids, they're their kids and they drive them like they're their kids and it's their bus, even though it's my bus. And uh, they, uh, they just believe it's their run, their kids that, you know, they're just dedicated and uh, I have faith in them no matter where they're driving. Yeah, I mean, I'll say that I'm in my eighth year of having a student on one of your buses and, you know, all three of my students are on your buses this year and our bus drivers have always been excellent. Um, I think if we could see, can we schedule that safety presentation? You know, Russ said it's, I'm, I'm looking at you, George. Um, for one of our upcoming meetings, I think it would be interesting. Like it's certainly not information that I've heard before. You know, I don't know how long it's been since Russ has done that. If we could schedule that for an upcoming meeting, I think that would be helpful for a lot of us. It was, a school board. It was kind of a seatbelt to not seatbelt presentation essentially, but it has a lot to do with safety and compartmentalization, how the kids are protected on the bus. And there's a lot of statistics that's going on over the years in our industry. We have a PSBA too, Pennsylvania School Bus Association, and a different one. But um, I've been a board member in there 25 years, and I've been in the safety committees. Uh, so it's a great presentation. I th unfortunately, the day we did it, I'm going to say eight or 10 years ago, I think uh, three parents showed up. <laughs> and it was a little bit disappointing, but understandable if everybody's busy, you know, this is what it is. Yeah, I, think, yeah, I, think you make it a, I think you make it a better turnout with the Zoom scenario. Uh, we're finding a big difference relative to people showing up in person. So, but yes, I, I think that's a good idea, Sarah. Uh, if Russ, if you're willing to do that, come up with one. Um, I'd appreciate it maybe at an upcoming uh, meeting. Uh, we can plan it. Are there PTA meetings, George, or, or PTA meetings? Is that the theory? A PTA meeting type such situation, or um, I think or, would, I, I'm, one of these meetings, Russ, one, like, like either another operations meeting or actually the general board meeting would probably be best. Um, we get we do get quite the turnout um, to most of these meetings now, uh, which is great. Uh, but I do I agree with Sarah. I think it'd be a good opportunity because I don't believe I've ever seen that that type of presentation, and uh, I'm coming up on five years now here. Um, so I, I, I'd be I'd 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 love to hear that presentation. I, I think the, the 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 crux of it too is I hear um, I'm I'm sitting here listening to Sarah and I'm here listening to you, Russ. Um, I, I think the vast majority of our parents are are mostly concerned about our elementary age kids, not the Votech as much. And I'm not saying that we're not concerned, but we are very concerned about them, obviously. But that that is just based on where they have to go. It's almost a necessary evil to get to that point. Um, but uh, I think if we focus on the elementary level, as, as a, let's start there to make sure that they're not on 78, as we talked about earlier on as a board um, uh, about a year ago, I think that would be the best place to start at least. And, and I'm just, just so we're all talking about the same thing uh, um, and, and focusing on what, what really is gonna have the most impact for, our, for all of our students. So real quick, so right now the routes for the uh, elementary, the four elementary routes are right now designed not to use 78 and they've been asked to not use it unless it's absolutely necessary at this point. Uh, but I guess the next question really comes into is what about field trips? I assume that there's field trips that Paragon's had to take elementary students on 78. Does, do we have concerns with that or is it just really the daily commute? I think it's, I mean, personally, I would say it's the daily commute because I know, I mean, like certain grades go to Harrisburg. You're not getting to Harrisburg unless you're going 78. It's just not... I, I, is it even possible? I don't even know. It probably is. If you go back, it, is. It, would, it would be an overnight trip at that point. Right? Right. Yeah, no, I, I, I'll, I'll agree with that. Like my concern is, is the daily commute, not field trip so much. Yeah, George, I think, I think it's a good idea if we do have uh, Russ come back and give a general overview of, of the security on a bus. I mean, whether a child is on 78 or Emmaus Avenue, and, and their elementary child, how safe are they? I think the, the whole idea is them commuting from point A to point B 
And, uh, you know, what is the safety on a bus and not on a bus going forward? Because I concur with Russ having cross traffic and people on either side of the highway, it's probably debatable which one is, is safer going forward. Absolutely. That, that traffic and because I've been on Emmaus Avenue and I've blessed a few people that have cut across me or <laughs> cut me off or decided to do something that was a little unsafe. And it seems uh, unfortunately they do that with school buses as well. So I think a general understanding of how safe your child is in that school bus versus a car and what's there and why we have laws set up the way we do where they don't have mandated child seats or seat belts and what's in there would help the general public understand the safety of their child, whether they're in K or that we're that they're putting on that bus when it comes and pick them up. So I think it'd be quite useful. The only question I have, Russ, is what is the length of that presentation so we're prepared for that uh, and make sure we. Uh, get <laughs> that's part of the problem. It rich, rich was a forty-five <laughs> minute two hours that may kill a. Uh, a <laughs> I've given a, a. There's a. There's a series. There's a few videos. Uh, certainly one. Unfortunately, it's a very old video, but it's involved a test of a crash, and it's a little. They're dummies, but it's a bit graphic in some ways. But uh, overall, I asked PTAs in the past for about 45 minutes, but I certainly I could give you general touch points and bullet points um, in 10. Uh, you tell me and I'll custom I'll custom make it. Can you squeeze that down to about 10 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can talk for hours about school bus safety and, and really make you fall asleep, et cetera, but I can, I can do whatever you like. Yeah, thank you. Um, and we'll be in conversation regarding that. But uh, before we move on, I want to make sure all the board members who have any comments or questions can bring them up. Carol? I, I, I just have a comment. I think, I think the whole issue that was brought up was because last year, you know, when we were closing Western, we promised parents that no elementary kids would be on a bus on 78 unless, you know, if there was an accident or a road closure or something. And then some, some bus routes were taking I-78 and parents were unaware of it. So I think the biggest issue is the promise we made in certain instances wasn't kept. I think that's where the problem arose and we need to straighten out that issue. And, you know, and, and I think a presentation would help, um, but I think that's where the issue really arises. We promised the parents they wouldn't be on there. And a couple, and you know, maybe the bus drivers didn't know or they forgot or whatever, but parents found out that some of the buses were on I-78. That's where the upset has occurred. So well, that's all just a little bit, a little clear here that the, the runs don't come to us with left and turns and how to get places. They're, they're this, an order of stops, okay. not turn here, stay off. You know, we never got the directive to use the highway, not to use the highway, but to get from point A to point B, it never instructed us which way to go. It never does. All the routes come to us, and then we make the lefts and rights, uh, which the way we feel is more efficient. They come to us as a list with with a list of students attached to it, and uh, the, the computer program that Mark uses is a great job, but it it uh, uh, it leaves some flexibility to get to point A to point B, depending on traffic, traffic lights, etc. But once we do it one way. We tend to keep it that way when it's the most efficient way of doing it. Computers are great, but they don't know the traffic levels of certain intersections at certain times of the day. So the drivers start the route. They do it in the same order as requested, but oftentimes forget 70 for now. They think, well, we're going to use a street to go this way to avoid that particular situation and get to school on time. But once they do it, they keep that route the same way. We've always had flexibility to do it the most efficient way, time-wise, and make that schedule. Again, the routing is great, but it doesn't, it's not perfect time-wise when in the real world of running the roads. Okay. All right. Thank you, Russ. Uh, anybody else have any questions before I quickly bring up my thoughts? Just a comment that I'd like to make. Um, Russ, again, just to... Uh, duplicate some other comments. 
I've been on this board a long time and you have gone above and beyond for different occasions to get kids from here to there um, on a moment's notice. So I know your drivers for a long time. My, my kids are now out of the school 10 years, but God bless them for some of these conditions and roads that they have to use. You know, Mountain Park Road is not the best in in weather sometimes on a, a lane and a half wide street and you've got a bus. Um, South Forest Street, I see it daily on my way to work, how you've got two lanes in one direction and one lane in the other and folks just think they can go past the school bus. And, mm -hmm. you know, our drivers do, I feel, do the best they can to keep our, our kids safe. But um, I do have a... a a question and I, I saw something um, and I honestly don't remember where it was, it could have been Facebook. Is it true about the three black lines on a bus? That there, does anybody ever notice there's three black lines on the side of a bus? The floor. The, the one floor. is the floor. The one bus line is where the back of the, the benches, the seat, and the one is where the top of the seat is that any, um, effort to have to do anything if there's an incident firefighters whoever would know where the top of the seat is the bottom of the seat and the floor of the bus it's where the rub rails are yes mm -hmm. so that is true oddly new, new york drive, state. you know now sure. you drive around and you're looking at every school bus to see if it's got three black lines it's absolutely true um there used to be a snow line on the bottom which is optional now another line on the bottom of the, the panel but new york doesn't use black lines Interestingly, they're all yellow. So uh, well, it's state anyway. by state, state by state changes. But yes, that's a very good observation. Yes. So just more sure. you know for on a on a bus. But uh, once again, just thank you for all your dedication to Salisbury. It's my job, before, George. Before you jump into your comment, I just had one quick clarification. Uh, just so it's just for everybody that's on here and for for um, everybody that's watching. It, just so we're clear, moving forward, we're not going to use 78 for, for the elementary schools, correct? I just want to clarify that because that was the promise that we made um, months ago for when we closed Western. Um, so I, I understand Votech didn't need to do that, but for, our, for, Salisbury, for the elementary school level kids, we're not going to use 78, correct? Are you asking me? Or I'm who, asking who every, anybody who's going to confirm the answer. <laughs> yeah. I want to confirm the answer is what I want, just so it's public and out there. Before you, before you say, uh, I should add one more thing. There's non-public, there's special needs, might, or we'd have to check everything. So when you make an edict of what to do here, just keep that in mind that uh, there's other than Salisbury Township School District vehicles, public school runs using that. So. There's more involved than just the Salisbury elementary students. And, and as of now, if I can interject here, um, Russ and I spoke and uh, I spoke with his operations manager, Nancy Kern, uh, and instructed the drivers not to use 78. We obviously wanted to discuss this um, further, uh, but we're, we're gonna be utilizing Emmaus Avenue for the moment for the elementary school students on the Western side. Correct. And I, I guess what you need to know is, is, is it an outright ban to never ever, or is it that we should, in most cases, use Emmaus, but what if there's an accident? What if there's weather conditions? Do they have the ability to, when circumstances dictate, utilize it? Is it that the, the main route should not use 78, but in extenuating circumstances, they're allowed to, or are they banned from it? No, I would agree with that. I, and that's just my two cents. I would agree to like extenuating circumstances and even uh, field trips when it's needed. Yes, I, I would, because I mean, you're not going to expect the bus driver to go to Harrisburg, not on 78. Um, and that, that's just, kind of, that, that's my two cents. Anybody else have any questions or comments on the board? Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, well, maybe a, qu a question and a comment. First, I would love to see that presentation. Um, my husband's an airline pilot and I have these arguments with people all the time who say they don't fly in an airplane, their whole family together. And I said, did you drive to the airport together? <laughs> you know, like does math 
apply in your life is sort of my point about that is, wait a minute, you all drove in a car to JFK, but you won't get on the same airplane, which is like 100,000 times or some statistic, you know, more safe. It's incredible, right? Yeah. So I would just be, I'd be curious and like your professional opinion, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do it, but I mean, we have other factors to consider, like, like you're saying, efficiency and time and all of that. Like, does it make that much, is it really not safer or is it just a perception that people have in general of being on a highway that it's not safer? Would be my question from like an expert in the field, I guess. It's absolutely true. The, the, the school bus is the number one ground transportation safety wise there is. And it's, a, it's not utilized miles wise because it's only seven to nine and two to four. So it doesn't compare to coach buses and, and the you know, millions of miles they put on in a year. But uh, as far as car versus bus, it's not even close to safety, just like a plane, you know, right. uh, the safety the, the, uh, the safety of the person and the child in this case. So it's, it's difficult to make an edict like that when we're, 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 we're going all over the district with field trips and sports trips and special needs. And it's, it, we just have to do a real, uh, and is that an elementary run or is that a, is that a middle school? <laughs> mm -hmm. One school uh, in non-public, for example, has kindergarten through eight. Well, so it would just be, if, if there is an elementary student on that particular vehicle that doesn't use any highway or do we call it any divided highway? Cause there's others around. At 78, we have one that goes up to 33 and, and uses to get to Bangor. I mean, right. I think that's it, what makes it tough. And I, I think it's it's hard to escape that. Like people have that perception in their head. And like I said, I deal with this with the airplane stuff all the time. It's hard to escape that. But I'm just, you know, no. just inserting that maybe logic in there or that thought process in there. You're making my opinion as a transportation professional, I believe we should have the ability to use any public road for any uh, student. However, I'm your contractor and I'll do whatever you want me to do. But you want my opinion, that's my opinion. We should have the ability to use any road. That's only my opinion. In fact, yeah, I think it, this goes back to, back to the fact that we are, we have already committed to this, to, 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 to certain mm -hmm. parents. And that's, and that's the driver for me. Um, and, and that, that alone, we, we gave our word and we should stand by that. Right. Yeah, that was, I was not in on that particular decision. So, I, yeah. So are we have any questions or comments on the board? So, George, just to recap a little bit. So, I, it sounds like the concerns more of the four runs from Western Salisbury, that would have been former Western Salisbury Elementary students going to Salisbury Elementary. It's not necessarily non-public runs, charter school runs, or anything else or field trips. It's primarily just those four daily runs from the Western side of town to Salisbury Elementary School. Is that what we're trying to avoid 78 at all costs, except for when absolutely necessary? Is that really what that, we're asking us to do then? That's the promise that was made. The answer is yes. Okay. okay. And uh, if nobody else has anything to say, I just uh, want to put in my two cents. Um, Russ, as much as I respect your opinion, this is your business and I do understand that. So uh, if you want to include what I'm about to bring up in your presentation, that would be great. But tentatively, we're gonna stay off of 78. Um, if things are a little bit delayed on Emmaus Avenue, I've already taken, my wife has taken Emmaus Avenue and I've taken uh, 78 and we've met at the intersection of the 4th Street Hill and Emmaus Avenue at the same times. In fact, sometimes Emmaus Avenue is quicker, but speed I'm not too worried about. But what I'm concerned about more than anything, this is more than just a four lane divided highway. There are many times and I'm sure everybody else has experienced this. You're at times I might exceed the speed limit and I'm cruising along heading whatever direction is south or east heading up that hill toward the exit toward the uh, summit exit. And before you know it, you have two taillights staring at you in the face. Cars go, trucks, they go from 70 down to 20. Um, and it, I think it's more than just a divided highway. It's a high risk area, which, is ha which has me concerned. And I feel what could possibly be, and I'm not even assured that that is the case, but there are times that if you're gonna say five minutes taking 78, to me, I'm just concerned 
you may have more of a possibility of getting an accident on Emmaus Avenue. I understand that because of cross traffic, that these are high speed accidents on 78 and the risk of major injury and or death, I think is far greater than it is on Emmaus Avenue. And that's part of what I'd like to hear within your presentation, uh, Russ, that you're gonna be giving us. Those are my concerns, other than the fact we made that promise. So I understand that to go out of town, if you're heading to Harrisburg, you don't have too much of a choice or heading out to other areas, you don't have a choice, but we do have a choice from the Western Salisbury area to, uh, to uh, the new SES. So that's my feeling on that. So, but in the meantime, you know, I'd love to see a presentation from you, Russ. So we'll follow up with the details for the presentation and what that looks like and um, when with Russ directly. Okay, thank you. And Russ, again, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mark. Oh, you're welcome. I just wanted to uh, mention uh, for everyone, I did reach out to uh, the IU. We have a transportation council that I meet with regularly. Um, put out a survey and there, there are no districts that in our area that actually uh, restrict using 78 with their school buses. And, and for good reason, uh, they are CDL trained drivers. I was a CDL examiner for the state for 11 years before I came to Salisbury. Uh, the one thing about commercial drivers, uh, class B vehicles like a school bus, uh, the exam they take, and I, I've done thousands of these exams and failed many people, uh, they, they are required to drive on a highway with that big vehicle. Um, whether it's a fire truck or a trash truck or a tractor trailer truck, I've done tests on all of them. Uh, so I understand the concerns, uh, but they are commercial professional drivers. And the thing about school bus drivers, they are, they're required more training than any other CDL driver out there. Uh, and I've had the privilege to work with Russ. Thank you uh, for what you had to say tonight. And um, we go back and forth uh, on the safest routes all the time. Uh, if, if a driver doesn't feel something safe, I adjust it on the run. Uh, and that's because you have to depend on these people. They, they put in hours behind the wheel and in classroom that other CDL drivers, I can get a tractor trailer truck driver, Russ, you know, they'll come to, they'll come to you and they want to drive a school bus. They can't until they go through all those classes. I don't care how many years they drove a commercial vehicle. Correct. Correct. Um, and um, to get licensed, drive a school bus, they're taking it all over again. So it is a big deal. Um, I trust his drivers. I have had the opportunity to sit in and teach some of his classes and watch his instructors. Uh, he does it as I did it before I came to Salisbury. And uh, that's why we work so well together uh, and we communicate very well together. So I just wanna thank you, Russ. And um, we'll, we'll get together on that presentation and uh, okay. Okay. be great. Great. Okay. Thank you guys. And we'll look forward to that. Okay. Um, do we have any other uh, uh, subject matter for uh, from the board? Anybody have any questions or comments on any other topics? All right, since I'm not hearing anything, I do. Um, I guess number one, um, this is referring to, I'm sure people have read about it. This is, I'm referring to the uh, SYA baseball field that uh, you've been hearing about uh, 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 having a location for that. And uh, one thing the township commissioners brought up, um, the opportunity to utilize their uh, maintenance staff uh, to do whatever changes would have to be made at the middle school field that was brought up. Uh, I organized a meeting there the other day and we met and um, it's a no go at the middle school. There are too many obstructions. Uh, there's a, an adjacent horse farm to the ballpark. And uh, I just wanna say, I wanna uh, uh, let the township know I appreciate them wanting to team up with us to uh, to help with uh, renovation of that field 
into a baseball field that uh, SYA can use, but unfortunately they can't use it because uh, there's a permanent structure that um, is well within the 300 foot limit in center field. And also there's an adjacent horse farm there that um, we'd end up, uh, foul balls would end up in that horse farm potentially harming the horses. And there's just too many things that have to be done there. So it's a no-go, but I want to thank the township for offering their help in partnering with us in terms of uh, making that conversion. So that's the first thing I'd like to say. And um, going back to PSBA, um, I just want to say that I did attend some of their workshops. And like I said, they are fantastic. Whoever hasn't, uh, hasn't attended them, uh, it's really a good thing to do. Um, one of the things they brought up was board retreats. And that's something I just want all the board members to think about doing. It, it's a gathering just with board members that uh, we collaborate. No decisions are made, obviously, in terms of uh, breaking the sunshine law, but um, it helps with uh, cohesiveness. It helps with getting everybody uh, to express their opinions and it gets the uh, school board to grow closer. And um, uh, it uh, helps with uh, having uh, just good dialogue with everybody. And I just want everybody to think about that. And another thing that we would, uh, I would like to share with everybody is self-evaluation of the board. Uh, for us to evaluate ourselves in terms of how we feel we're doing. And I think I could get the template from PSBA regarding that too. So just something for everybody to think about as to whether or not you might be interested in doing something like that. I was personally thinking about a retreat to Las Vegas. So whoever's interested in doing that, we could make that the venue. I better say I'm joking because I think the nasty grams will head my way, but just that's just a joke, somewhat of a joke. But um, but nevertheless, uh, something to think about though those issues. So um, uh, if nobody else has any other comments or uh, questions, I'd like to move on to citizen comments. Uh, Mr. Taylor, do we have anybody? Uh, yes, we currently have two individuals signed up. First, it's Laura McKelvey, followed by uh, Nicole Hickson. And uh, and Laura, you are with us now. Thank you, Mike. Um, so I just wanted to briefly comment on the bus issue. Um, so I do thank you board members for ensuring that your promise is kept. Um, I am not a transportation expert, but I do have a degree in physics and um, buses are extraordinarily safe even without seat belts. But that being said, um, the, the main issue, at least in my mind, is the speed traveled on Emmaus Avenue versus on 78. If you double your speed, um, you quadruple both your stopping distance and the amount of kinetic energy, which is your, your movement energy that you have. And if you increase your speed by three times, so if you're going 75 miles per hour instead of 25, you increase both your stopping distance and kinetic energy by nine times. So in both of those cases, as Mr. Katanis was correctly stating, um, the risk of harm to children in a collision is greatly increased regardless of whether or not you're in a car or on a school bus. And given that some of these little guys, especially kindergartners, first, second graders, I can just think, you know, there's a million little boys on those buses bouncing around and the driver has to focus on their driving, regardless of how professional or well-trained they are, their focus is on their driving. They can't be monitoring student behavior all the time. And all it takes is one little kid in the aisle during an accident where we have a disaster. So I really do believe it's important to keep our littles off of 78 as much as possible. And for the issue of um, field trips, I think that's kind of a non-issue, right? And when you have a field trip situation, you've got five, six parent chaperones on that bus in addition to the bus driver who can help with monitoring behavior, ensuring everyone is remaining seated. So I don't even see that as an issue. So I really do thank you for uh, looking at our, our littlest kids and keeping them safe. All right, now we have uh, Nicole Hickson and let me bring her in. All right, Nicole. 
All right. Um, I, I want to start out just by saying thank you to the administration for responding so quickly. Yep, that was me who brought up the busing issue last week um, to anybody who wasn't on that meeting. So I, I am the problem causer and the pot stirrer, but um, I do appreciate how quickly the administration followed up with me. Um, and I, I appreciate your approachability and all of that. So um, I just want to start, you know, I, I know I hold your guys' feet to the fire, but I also want to give credit where it's due. So um, I don't want to always just be the one who's, you know, has something negative to say. Um, I do want to mention that my children as recently as dinner tonight told me they were still taking 78 today, even though I know that we've had conversations that that would no longer be an issue. So um, regardless of statistics on bus safety and personal motor vehicle safety, the fact still remains that a promise was made last year that our kids weren't going to be on 78 and for daily transportation. I totally get the all of the little nuances and all of the little details about field trips and whatnot like that, I, I get it. Um, but for daily transportation for our Western kids that are now traveling across the district to the other side of town, I, I think that it is important that the administration and the district keep their word and um, just hope that you guys will take that opportunity to please again, get that resolved. Um, I, I do want to say we love our bus driver. I don't have any problems with him personally. Like we honestly love our bus driver. I just don't want him taking my kids on the freeway when we've been told that that's not where we're going. So I hope that you guys can continue to follow up on this and get it taken care of ASAP. Excuse me, um, can whomever uh, check that out I'm not real thrilled about hearing. If that is the case that they're on 78 again, I heard that yesterday, please, I'm about to lay across the on-ramp at some point, please stop that. Nicole, can you throw in the chat box the, 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 the bus number that, that you're on just so we can we can look at specifics? Yeah, I'm, I'm aware, thank you. We'll, yeah. we'll follow up. All right, do we have anybody else, Mike? Uh, there's nobody else signed up at this time. Okay. Thank you, everybody. All right. Uh, our next meeting is Wednesday, May 5th, and that will be Zoomed, of course. And uh, I want to thank everybody who was uh, involved in today's meeting. I thank the community also. So with that, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Take care, guys. Good night. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you to our um, guests for joining us. We appreciate you taking the time to join the meeting. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.